This morning we start a four-week series on the Psalms, right? That's why you might have been a little confused this morning. I had Sarah Beth read the, the scripture passage from Luke, which is a companion to the day's text, which if you didn't figure out how that fits in, you'll find out here in just a little bit. And then we all read the Psalm together as we normally do. So for the next three weeks after this, we'll do the same thing. We'll have a, a probably a gospel reading read by our reader, and then we'll read the Psalm together, and, and I'm going to preach to you on the Psalm. And this morning, Psalm, Psalm 113 is a psalm of praise. It's, about, it's a psalm that was written by someone who, when things are going good, this is what we could do for God, right? Because it talks about who should be praised. Who, who should be praised? Who, who? I heard it. Say louder. The, say louder, Renee. Lord. I know you can talk louder than that. <laughs> The Lord should be praised, right? The name of the Lord should be praised. The Lord himself should be praised. And we should praise God because that's what we need to do. Now, does God actually need us to praise him? No, he really doesn't. Does he want us to? Maybe. Then we can say God's a little narcissistic. But he's not, right? God doesn't want us to praise Him because He just wants us to praise Him. God wants us to praise Him because God is good to all of us, right? And that's what the psalmist continues on. And it's not very clear in this psalm about what happens here, right? Because things get lost in translation. When we, when we translate something from one language to another, we lose a lot of stuff. And we don't completely understand what's being said. Right? Praise the Lord. Praise you, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. And this is one of the verses that I, I had a hard time with when I first read it. Chapter, verse 3. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So does that mean that there's a time that we shouldn't praise God's name? Because the sun rises and then it sets, right? But does it actually... It's always rising someplace. So the sun is always up somewhere on the face of the earth, right? Because the earth is round. And as the earth spins, the sun goes up and down. So the sun is actually always in the sky. When I first thought, when I first read it, I was like, so we're only supposed to praise God when the sun is up for us. No, wait, that means that the sun is up for somebody else, someplace else. So we should always be praising God because the, the light is always there, right? We don't think that the sun's not coming back at night. We know for a fact that tomorrow morning what's going to happen. We may not see it. It may be behind the clouds. But what is still there? The sun. It's always there, even if we can't see it. Just like the moon. How many of you have, could probably see the moon this morning when you drove to, to worship? If you looked for it really hard, it was there. It's up there. You can see it all the time. So all the time is when we should praise God's name. Not just when we think we should or when things are going bad. But like I said, this is a psalm of praise. We're supposed to praise God all the time. Because who is like God? No one is like God. See, God sits so far up above us, but yet he always is always reaching down to be with us. And this is where it gets a little funky because we don't really get it, right? In these last three verses, 7, 8, and 9, it says... He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and with princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her a joyous mother of children. See, this is actually all one run on sentence that only really has one verb. And it has two singular people involved with it. It has one male and one female. And it gets lost when we try to figure out what it's actually saying, right? Because it says that God is, even though God is way above, ab above us, even though God is up in the heavens. And you have to remember, in this day and age, they understood the, the earth or the construction of the planet to be heavens and God up above, everything that God created in the middle, and then whatever you know, Sheol or hell or whatever you want to refer to as the place that was not a part of either one of those two, right? 
That's how they thought about it, that God was way up here, and He was always looking down upon us. They didn't think in the, in the understanding of a relationship. But that's what this is talking about, actually, because God, even though God sits way up above us, God reaches down into our lives, and when other people say that we're nothing and we're worthless, God reaches in and pulls us up. When other people say that we're trash and we need to be thrown away, God reaches in and pulls us out of that heap and brings us up and wipes us off and stands us back up and sends us back out there. Because what this says is that God takes the man and has him to sit in the place of the princes. He takes the man out of the heat, ash heaps, out of the trash bin where the, everyone else has thrown him and sets him on, his, on God's throne. And just like the, the woman who is in the trash heap, she, he takes her up and makes her to be a dwelling place. See, that's where it gets lost because this word means to, the verb in this sentence means to sit or it means to dwell. And we get confused by the way that it's written, because it's, it's not talking about separate things. It's talking about the exact same thing that God does for men and God does for women. He takes both of us, right? One man, one woman, which means all of us, and lifts us up from where we are, lifts us up from the, the places that we get thrown into, and makes us perfect like Him, cleans us off like Him, sets us on His throne, and makes us to be the mother of a joyous household. That's what God does for each and every one of us. God searches all over to find us. See, that's the connection between chapter 15 of Luke. The woman who searched high and low in her house, right? She lost one coin, which you would think, what does that mean, one coin? It probably wasn't even a day's wage. It was probably a penny in our understanding. But it was one-tenth of what she had. And so she wasn't going to let it go. So she turns over the entire house to find this one minuscule little coin. And that's what God does for each and every one of us. He turns over the entirety of creation to find you when you're lost. To bring you back. To set you into the place that He belongs. And to give you the treasures that only He can give you. That's how much God loves you. And that's how much God is going to seek after you. You see, no matter what happens, no matter where you go, God is always searching and God is always waiting for you to come and be a part of what is already existing there. Because God is in a relationship and God wants that relationship to be with you. He loves you so much that he's not possibly going to leave you where you were. But he's going to lift you up and give you the place that belongs to only him. So that you can be with him. So go into the world and share what God has given to you with everyone else. So that they can know how much you are loved by God. And how much they can be loved by God too.